Amen. How you doing today? All right. Look at that. Looks like we've got two weeks in a row. We've been allowed to tag people. I went with the full 50 today just to see. We only did a few last week. Uh, and it allowed me to log on. So praise God for that. Hey, man. All right. I I'm excited today. I ain't been ex this excited since what? Uh, last Sunday when I preached. Amen. So, hey, we are so looking forward to what the good Lord's got for us here today. Hope you are as well. Amen. So let's go ahead and open up here in a word of prayer. Our most gracious Father in heaven, we do thank you, Lord, for loving us. We thank you, Father, for saving us. We thank you, Father, for keeping us. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't save us to trade us away or anything else like that. You're just going to go ahead and keep us. Thank you, God, for that. Thank you. I want to ask you, Father, please, for your blessings upon the, the service here today and help me, Lord, to present the service and the sermon the way that you'd have me to. And it'd be a help to each and every one there in the sound of my voice, not, not because it's me, but because it is you. I thank you, Father, that you've chosen to use a, a pitiful wretch like myself. Thank you. I do ask you, Father, please, to help me, Lord, to say only what needs to be said, nothing more, nothing less. We pray, Father, for all the prayer requests been made known and the unspoken for uh, Mom and Dad as they're fighting the illness down there in Tennessee and uh, Brother Henry Allen and all he's going through. And uh, pray, Lord, for all those, uh, Wesley Poston and all of his health issues and Brother James Jacobson and, and uh, the need for the mission board there and his finances and our finances. And Lord, we we got so many people who are, are in need of, of financial assistance, jobs, and food and whatnot. We know, Lord, that you can take care of all the need. And we're asking you, Father, please to do that. We pray, Father, for our lost loved ones to, to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And and for our, our loved ones, our, our friends, family who have gone astray, that they will come back to you. I ask you, Father, for uh, Joey Hetzel and uh, uh, his family as they're dealing in this time of loss here. Uh, with his mother having passed away yesterday. And pray, Lord, that you'd comfort him and help them, Father. Thank you, God, for loving us and saving us. In Jesus' precious name we do pray. Amen and amen. All right, how about we start off with this good song here, Just a Closer Walk with Thee. <clears throat> I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to thee. And just a closer walk with thee. Grant it, Jesus, is my plea. Daily walking close to Thee, oh let it be, dear Lord, oh let it be. Through this world of toil and snares, if I falter, Lord, who cares? No, I'm sorry. Who with me my burden shares? None but thee, dear Lord, oh, none but thee. And just a closer walk with thee. Grant it, Jesus, is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Oh, let it be, dear Lord, oh, let it be. When my feeble life is old, time for me will be no more. Guide me gently, safely, oh, to thy kingdom shore. To thy shore, and just a closer walk with thee. Grant it, Jesus, is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Oh, let it be, dear Lord. Oh, 
song. Let it be, let it be, dear Lord, oh, let it be. Hey, man, hey, man. All right, how about this good song here called Heavenly Sunlight? Heavenly Sunlight, like it. Walking in sunlight all of my journey over the mountains through the deep vale and Jesus has said I'll never forsake thee promise divine that never can fail heavenly sunlight heavenly sunlight Flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah. I am rejoicing, singing his praises. Jesus is mine. Shadows around me, shadows above me, never conceal my Savior and guide. He is the light, in him is no darkness. Ever I'm walking close to his side. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah. I am rejoicing, singing his praises. Jesus is mine. In the bright sunlight, ever rejoicing, Pressing my way to mansions above, singing his praises, gladly I'm walking, walking in sunlight, sunlight of love. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing. Singing his praises, Jesus is mine. Hey, man, hey, man, can you say that this morning yourselves? Jesus is mine. Very, very important question for you this morning. Because if he's not yours, if you are not saved by God's grace, guess what? Today is an excellent day to ask Jesus to save you from eternity in hell. He's promised that whosoever shall call upon his name shall be saved. But you've got to believe it. You've got to understand that you need him, that he's the only way to get you to heaven, and then ask him to do it. Simple as that, church. <laughs> All right. Uh, that being said, uh, we'll go ahead and take and turn our Bibles over to the book of 2 Peter, chapter number 2. And while you're turning there, uh, for those of you who might be interested, uh, this coming Tuesday night at 6.30, we will be uh, uh, one of two preachers preaching over at uh, Sunrise Baptist Church. And uh, we are certainly looking forward to that. Uh, not going to be terribly long because we're supposed to only keep it to like 15 minutes or so. Uh, of course, I'm also preaching with Clement Chappelle, so uh, yeah, it might be 15 minutes on my part, you know, half hour on his, so it's a little longer, but hey, don't worry about it because you're going to be getting the good stuff from the Word of God. Maybe not from me, but from him, for sure. Amen. So, <laughs> all right. <clears throat> I trust I have stalled enough by now, and you have found your place here in Second Peter chapter number 2, and we want to read just three verses here real quickly this morning. Uh, we'll begin reading in verse number 6. And the Bible says, Peter, writing under inspiration of the Holy Ghost, writes these words. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just lot. Now, that, that doesn't mean he only delivered Lot, because we also know his two daughters escaped as well. Just meaning righteous. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. A... Uh, 
The last three weeks we have looked at the thought of a young man and uh, what we want to continue to do is look today at this idea of a floundering young man. A floundering young man. Our most gracious Father in heaven, we do thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. We do uh, pray, Father, for your blessings upon this time here in the, uh, the service. Help me, Lord, please, to present it the way you'd have me to, that it would be a help to each and every one who tunes in and that they will get exactly what it is that they need out of the sermon. So that they can go forward in your power and your strength and, and do the works, the deeds that you would have for them to do. Help us, Father, please, to take full advantage of all the opportunities, all the blessings that you have put in our path so as that we can serve you to the utmost for your honor and your glory. Help me, Lord, please, to present the sermon now the way that you'd have me to, that they wouldn't see me, but that they would see Jesus high and lifted up. And we do pray, Lord, for each and every one in the sound of our voice here, for whatever uh, need is there on their hearts right now, Lord, that you would please take care of that according to your holy will. And if there's someone out there who does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, that they would make today that wonderful, glorious day. Thank you, Father, for loving us and saving us. In Jesus' precious name we do pray. Amen and amen. All righty. So, a floundering young man. Uh, let's face facts, to be a Christian living in this sinful world today is difficult. <laughs> uh, Jesus did promise us there in the book of John that we would have troubles and trials while we were in this world, but to be of good cheer, for he has overcome the world. Yes, that's great. But let's also face facts. If we were to break this down, we are still in our fleshly bodies. Our flesh craves sin. Now, if you are truly saved, if you have truly been born, birthed into the family of God, your spirit that is now alive inside of you wants to live for God. And it must be Bring your body under subjection. Like the, the rider uses the bridle to bring the horse under control. To make it turn to the right, to the left, to, to stop, to go forward. Whatever the case is there. We need to do that with our flesh. The more time we spend in God's word. The more time we spend with our fellow believers. The more time we spend hearing the word of God. The more time we spend doing the word of God. The more time we spend singing God's praises. The easier time we're going to find ourselves having uh, avoiding sin. Because we're going to be too occupied to be doing the sin. Conversely. Our flesh craves sin. Like it craves air to breathe. Food to eat. Water to drink. Though we might partake of it in uh, uh, other means. The water gets substituted out for alcohol. Uh, so on and so forth. There we, we change food for drugs. Whatever the case would be there. Uh. So we're fighting this battle on a daily basis. Serve the Lord, serve our flesh. And because the Bible tells us that we walk by faith, not by sight, we have to understand that we need to get in here and we need to follow God's commands. Our flesh sits back and says, Buster, I can't see God. I can experience the blessings, but quite frankly, they're not quite as tangible in my brain as I want them to be. But I can experience the things of this world. And this world is very real. This world calls to us, come back. This world invites us with the most tempting of things to get us to come back to it, to live like it, to be one just like it. You've got faith, good for you. Come on back home. 
Come on back to the one who loves you. Yeah, loves to kill you. What here is a person who has faith in God. He was a believer. Yeah, we wouldn't get that just from reading the Genesis account. Uh, let's face facts. Uh, Genesis paints a very poor picture of Lot. We go and we read the, all, everything there in Genesis. Uh, we expect Lot to have split hell wide open. Thank God that the, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself. Because Peter here, he comes along all these hundreds of years later and says, Just Lot. As a matter of fact, he calls him that three times. I understand in verse 8 it's translated righteous uh, for that righteous man or that just man. Uh, vexed his righteous or his uh, vexed his just soul. Okay, Same difference there. The words are interchangeable. Uh, he, we would call him a Christian today. Problem is, though, uh, he chose to live a life out in the world. And it ends up becoming miserable for Christians who decide to live their lives out in the world. Because, number one, you are directly opposed to God when you are living out in the world, yet His Holy Spirit is living inside of you. You are supposed to be serving Him, but you are serving your own flesh. The punishment that comes your way is God's correcting you to try to get you to come straight. All this misery and so much more we just ain't got time to get into here. God. It's because we are floundering in our faith. Now, as I began to study out Lot here, I, I honestly expected to go one direction uh, with the sermon. Instead, I, I went back to English class and and thinking about how uh, when you're doing a report on something, you, what you need to do is you need to, who, what, where, when, why, how, to what extent. You know, you answer the questions. And I, and I do enjoy uh, doing that from time to time. And so I got to thinking about Lot here. And, and not so much as uh, questioning these things, but as to pointing out what it is. First of all, is where he was. The Bible tells us that Lot went to Sodom. Now these the people of these cities... There's three things I want you to notice about them down there in Sodom. They, they lived a very immoral lifestyle. Uh, today we call it sodomy. And we'll explain that to you in another sermon, I suppose. Uh, but, but the fact of the matter is uh, they, they were practicing a homosexual lifestyle. They, they were practicing that anything goes. Uh, what we really exploded back in the 1960s with free love, they'd already done it. Been there, got it. Anything and everything goes. They were already living it. Because they were already living with such an immoral lifestyle, uh, they were therefore teaching an immoral philosophy of whatever it is that makes you feel good, do it. They beat Nike to that one, the, the just do it slogan there. They already had that one, just do it, whatever you want. Don't believe me? Read about how they... The, the two messengers from God, those two angels, came into town. And, and Lot says, hey, you all don't want to abide in the street. You really want to come into my house for safety. And the men of the of the city came out and they said, hey, you know what? We want to know you. And it's not, hey, hey, my name is Dennis. You know, my name is Joe, anything like that. It was, uh, we want to rape you. And, and it felt good for them. They weren't the ones getting raped, I guess. So that's why it felt good for them. But whatever they wanted to do, they would do it. And this is the place where Lot has decided to bring up his family? It's one thing to, that 
it's coming up all around you like here in America. It's another thing to go down there and say, I want to get in, in and, and be right here where the action's taking place. But number three, where he was, they desired immoral laws. You see, Lot comes down there, and we'll get into this in a little bit more detail here in a moment, uh, but he ends up moving into Sodom, and the Bible tells us there uh, that he ends up sitting in the gate of the city. Now, those who sat at the gate of the city in Old Testament times, what that meant was that they were uh, judges. If you had a matter that needed to be judged uh, between you and your neighbor or, or whatever the case was, you would go to these people that sat there in the gate of the city and you would present your side of the case. The other person would present their side of the case. And then that person who sat in the gate would decide which one was right. 100% for you, 100% for you. It's a 60-40 split. Uh, you owe him this much. You owe him that much. So on and so forth. And so when the angels are now inside of Lot's house and the men are trying to knock down the door so that they can get to those two angels, Lot says, hey, hey, hey you don't want to do this. The men of the city got downright mad at him and says, you're the one who moved in here. You wanted to be a judge. We didn't want you to be a judge. You know why they didn't want him to be a judge? Because when it came down to it, even though he was not living a life that was separated for Christ, they still recognized that he was a righteous judge. That he could not be bought. That he could not uh, be bribed. That he would be fair in his judgments. And they didn't like that. They come up to him and say, hey, hey, hey bub, here, here's a 10. You know, How about ruling for me? Hey, I, I need to, I really need this to be settled in my favor. Uh, I'll do whatever you, you want. Just rule in my behalf. And Lot says, no, I'm going to rule based on what is right and what is wrong. And they did not like that. And now here they are just outright telling him to his face, we don't like how you've been working. So this is where he was. And it's one thing for a missionary to go to such a place, uh, go to Las Vegas, you know, all the gambling and, and prostitution that's legal out there, and go there to win souls. It's one thing to go there to win souls to serve the Lord. It's another thing that you want to move there just because that's where all the pretty lights are, and, 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 the, and the money is flowing, and you can make a fortune there. See the difference, church? Lot went to Sodom because that's where it was. That's where it was happening. And it was him climbing down into the muck and mire and the sewers of the world. Christians shouldn't be climbing down in the sewers of the world. Get down there in the gutter and help pull those people up out of the sewer, but not get down in there with them. Why was he there? He started off well. He started off traveling with Uncle Abraham. We read that there in Genesis chapter 12, verse number 5. God had told Abraham to leave everybody behind, take Sarah, your wife, or Sarai at the time, and, and get you out and go to the place I tell you to. Leave your family behind. But he still brought his nephew Lot with him. I kind of wonder about that. Is it a matter of that he... Lot was just deemed too young to lead by himself. Well, was Lot actually uh, a believer and he wanted to know more about the Lord? I think we can all think of some young people out there. They got saved and they got on fire for God and they, and they want to know more about him. But instead of growing in the Lord, something happened to them and they got cold and they began to flounder. And next thing you know, they've moved away from God. Think of one young man right now. He was on fire for God and something happened. He ended up in rehab. Lost his family. Lost everything. Because he began to flounder in his faith instead of nourishing it the way it needed to be. Now, so he's lot here. He starts off traveling with Uncle Abraham. 
But then problems really started kicking in once he got rich. You know, wealth back then was determined by how many animals you own, how many servants you've got, not exactly by how much coin you got in your pocket. But he got rich, and then dear old Uncle Abraham kind of stumbled in his faith. Uh, we read in the second half of chapter 12 of Genesis there, when he decides, hey, we got this famine going on, God ain't said nothing to me yet, I'm going to move my family down to Egypt. And, and Sarah, you are a fine-looking woman, uh, I, and I don't want anyone to kill me so that they can have you for their wife, so you just tell them you're my sister. It's, it's a half-truth. You're my half-sister. Lot sitting there scratching his head. He says, wait a minute, I thought God could take care of you. I thought God was going to supply all of our need. What's up with that, Unc? <laughs> and then I think Lot began to get frustrated by the constraints of a godly life. A lot of, of Christians, young Christians especially, but older ones can too. Uh, that constraint of, I've got to stay on the straight and narrow way and do what God would have me to do. I need to be able to stretch out. I need to have some room to move, get the, get the legs going, get the blood flowing. It's just one little thing here, and, 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 and you know, I can use this somehow as a witnessing tool, and I can serve the Lord better this way. And, and, but the reason why it's the constraints for a godly life is because without the constraints, we'll crash and burn. We will get into trouble. The kite as it soars majestically through the air, hates the string that is constraining it. But it's that very string that keeps it aloft. See, without it, the, the kite suddenly starts flipping all over, and next thing you know, it crashes into a tree and it's destroyed. It crashes into the ground, it's destroyed. It gets blown away, never to be seen again. The string protects the kite. It guides the kite. And maybe I can get me a string to help with these floorboards to stop it from squeaking. <laughs> so Lot got frustrated with the constraints of this life. I'm sure he even viewed his uncle as a, a hypocrite because of what happened down there in Egypt. And that, that didn't help. It never helps when, you're, you, when you view, start viewing people as hypocrites because they turned out to be human. And then, of course, the riches began, you know, just kept on growing, and, and the herds got so big, it got to the point where, well, we need to separate them. We, we, one herd needs to go one way, the other herd needs to go the other way there. And as he looked around, he saw, the Bible tells us there in, in Genesis 13, verse 7 through 12, the well-watered plains surrounding Sodom and Gomorrah. And how it reminded him so much of Egypt. That, that's very telling. See, once you're saved, you ain't going back to being lost. The, the, Egypt represents the world. It represents being lost. It, you don't get to go back there. Because you can't lose your salvation. Thank God for that. But this world will entice you with everything to make you think, Hey, look, you can have it just as good. You're still saved. But it's just as good. And he looked there at the well-watered plains of Sodom and says, Yes, that's it. That's what I want. I'm going down there. And in the process, he moved away from the godly influence of Uncle Abraham. And when we get away from those godly influences and we start substituting things out that are not of God, it looks like it is. Hey, that well-watered plains, you got lush grass to take care of your animals? So your animals can eat, they can be healthy, they can breed more animals, so on and so forth. That looks like a blessing from God. Looks aren't everything. We got to remember that, church. Looks aren't everything. Where he thought he was getting blessed was a curse instead. Because he got away from God. So he moved down there on the outskirts of, of Sodom. Genesis 14, verse 12 tells us that he finally went ahead and moved right on into Sodom. 
See, when we give Satan an inch, he does become a ruler. We've got to avoid those situations. But how did he get inside? How did this floundering young man go from being on the outskirts of Sodom to just moving right on up to the east side? Well, God sent him a message that he was getting too close to sin. He was snuggling up too much with it. We read there in the first part of chapter 14 of Genesis, the very first recorded war. I don't know if it was the first war, but it's the first recorded war. And instead of taking the hint, hmm, I probably don't want to hang around here because there's going to be trouble. Lot says, I'm going to move right on in. Do the exact opposite of what God says to do. And how many times do floundering Christians do just that? God sends them a warning. Get away from that mess. And instead they say, I want even more of it. Something comes our way. And this looks good. This looks exactly like what I want. And disaster follows instead. Now let's face facts. Disaster followed Lot really quickly here. How many Christians start messing with sin? And God's saying, look, I'm giving you warning after warning after warning. This is not right. This is unholy. This is not what I want for you. Get away from it before it messes up your life. But instead, we choose to not listen and we fall into judgment. Well, when he was there... He got used to how things were done. It quickly became business as usual for him. And let's face facts, this world does not mind you having religion. This world does not mind you having faith in one God. In Jehovah God. Go ahead. Hey, you believe in Jesus? That's fine. It's all good in the hood. So long as all that faith doesn't interfere with what the world wants. With what the flesh wants. Then it's a problem. Now Lot, even though he has been vexing his soul with everything that's going on around him, still has some modicum of faith. How do you know that, preacher? Because he tried to protect the messengers. Whether he knew that they were angels or not, don't matter. He tried to protect him. He tried to get him in off the street to begin with. And then once they were in the house, he tried to protect him. His faith ran out really quick, though. Because sin was so normal for him. By this point in time, all the, the particular sin surrounding him was so normal that even though he protected the two messengers, he offered to take his two virgin daughters... And throw them outside and let them be gang raped however they, the rapists wanted to do it. To protect these two men. Two strangers versus his own flesh. <sighs> My soul. After the messengers, the angels struck the men with blindness told Lot, hey, go tell your sons-in-law, your daughters that are married, to pack up and get out with you. Lot went and did that. They laughed at him. He went back home and he started, hmm, well, I need to dust before we leave. I got to make sure all of my bills have been paid before I leave. I'm trying to stall because I know that you can't destroy the city while I'm here. And so long as I stay here, God can't do nothing. Honey, if that's the situation you're thinking is correct, you are so wrong. Just because you're there doesn't mean God can't work. The only reason God allowed Lot to get out of Sodom and Gomorrah, because let's face facts, God does punish those who are his 
We're told that very explicitly there in Hebrews chapter number 13. The only reason Lot didn't get the full whipping that he deserved was because Uncle Abraham was up there on the mountaintop and he's praying and he's calling upon the Holy God for mercy to spare those who are inside. Can you, if there's 50 righteous, if there's 45, if there's 40, 30, 20, 10, and he had to leave off there. Because I believe Abraham knew that if he'd have said five, God would have said sure and Abraham would have known. There ain't five, and I'm wondering, I'm worried that Lot wouldn't even count as one. So here's Lot in the side, deliberately stalling on leaving town. We read that in Genesis 19, verse 16. And once he is out of town, the, the angels tell him, all right, flee to the mountain. And Lot says, oh, please, not to the mountain. Some evil will, will get me, some wild animal will keel haul me. Uh, let me run over to that city over there. It's a little city. And since Abraham left off with ten righteous and uh, that city that was little got spared, there must have been nine righteous people in there and Lot made number ten. Leastwise, that's what I think. But Lot's faith was so strained, so weak. That word vexed means to be exhausted, to be worn down with toil, to wear out. It was so vexed that fear quickly took over. People, maybe he thought the people of the city would, would blame him for the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It, what, maybe, maybe he was worried he was just too poor and they would look down on him and they would do some bad things to him. Whatever the case is, he says, that's it. I'm out of here. I'm going to flee to that mountain. Was it flee? Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Wasn't that the exact same mountain God told him to flee to to begin with? But he flees the town that he wanted to be in, to go to the mountain that God had told him to be at. And of course, there in the mountain, we find that he was actually a willing drunk. You see, life had so beaten him down. And his daughters offered him wine. Give me. <laughs> I'll chug it by the bottle. You don't even have to worry about a glass. The incest was, is on his daughters. He was drunk at the time, but the fact of the matter is he, he allowed himself to get drunk. All because when he was there in Sodom, all of this became normal. And a Christian who is floundering in their faith will find things are normal. They, they will find that sin defeats them to the point where it's like, Okay, I'll just go with the flow. Lot was no longer shaken by the things he heard and saw going on all around him there in Sodom. It was second nature to him. Christians who become accepting and comfortable with the sin that surrounds them endangers themselves with the possibility of engaging in the exact same sin. I'll never do that. Five years later, where are they? Oh, they're doing the exact same thing. They said they wouldn't. So what can we learn from this floundering young man? As I stated earlier, if we just go by the events of the book of Genesis, he's in hell right now. Thank God. Thank God. God, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. And like I said, though, we have to look and see the whole story. Because if we just go by the first thing we see, once Genesis 19 closes, Lot locks, he walks off into the pages of history. He's gone. We will sit here and criticize him and talk about how evil he was and how he's in hell right now burning pain for those sins. 
But if we dig a little deeper and we compare Scripture with Scripture and we come all, all the way over here, the hundreds of years later, and, and we see that Peter writes now and delivered just lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. We see three times there, he is just, he is righteous, he is saved, he is one of God's children, he is one of those who was saved. Saved on credit, waiting for the day that Calvary would finally roll arrive. And when Calvary arrived, three glorious days later, the stone would be rolled away and Jesus would rise triumphant. Taking captivity captive, moving those who were in the paradise section of hell and moving it up there by heaven. Including not only Father Abraham, but just law. What can we learn from this? How about instead of we criticizing the fallen and the floundering, we start praying for them. I can't help but imagine that Barnabas, even though his cousin John Mark just walked away, in Acts 13, he kept praying that John Mark would get his heart right for God and got excited and shouted when John Mark came to him and says, God has gotten me right with him and I'm going to follow, I'm going to serve. I can't help but think, as Demas said, Paul, peace out. I'm heading to Thessalonica where I can have the love of this world. And as Paul dictated his letter, as Tychicus and Dr. Luke stood by, that they were silently praying for Demas to get right. And we certainly know that even before he fell, even before he denied the Lord three times, Jesus has already said that he had been praying for Peter. What can we learn from a floundering young man? Pray, don't criticize. I've got just two questions and a statement for you here in closing this morning. Number one, have we abandoned the floundering brethren? I think we all know someone who's floundering. Number two, are we praying for their return to the faith? That's on us. And my statement is this. There are a lot of just lots out there who need our help. Our most gracious Father in heaven, we do thank you, Lord, for loving us and saving us. We do pray, Lord, now for your blessings upon this day. And that we ask you, Father, for each and every one of those who has gone astray, that they'd come right they'd come correct and get back to you. I thank you, Mama, was praying for me that I'd get right with you. And that everywhere she went, she requested prayer for me to do that. We pray, Lord, for all those who've they've gone. As far as we know, they're not in church anywhere. The one name is coming to mind right now, and I, I don't want to say because... Uh, I don't want to cause problems because I don't know where he's at at the moment. Could very well be right where he needs to be with you. I can only go by what little I know. And I'm asking you, Father, please, if he's not right with you, would you please would help him to get right. Get back to where he needs to be. Thank you, God, for loving us in spite of all we do. Thank you, Father, for saving us in spite of our very wicked sinfulness. Thank you, God, for just being you. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and amen. Sing our closing song here today. Well, if you know someone who's floundering, help them. Do what you can. Oh, they may not like it. They may not want it. They can't stop you from praying. 
Jesus' blood washed away all my sin. Will you accept this price and let him in? Into your heart, into your life, he will help and guide you through strife. He'll give you peace in everything. Oh, what joy this peace will bring. Accept the sacrifice from him, and you'll find great peace within. Do you accept the trials from God, the way that you accept the good? He sends the troubles down to you, for his grace will carry you through. He'll give, us, he'll give you peace in everything. Oh, what joy this peace will bring. Accept the sacrifice from him, and you'll find great peace within. He gives us trials and troubles to show he can handle the squabbles. When troubles and trials are over, he'll, you'll see all his blood will cover. He'll give you peace in everything. Oh, what joy this peace will bring. Accept the sacrifice from him, and you'll find great peace within. He'll give you peace in everything. Oh, what joy this peace will bring. Accept the sacrifice from him, and you'll find great peace within. <clears throat> hey, man, hey, man, I want to thank you for your attention. May the good Lord go with you throughout the course of your week. And don't forget, be at church today. And you say, well, preacher, it ain't Sunday. Well, okay, uh, get to church the next appointed time. And like we said earlier there, uh, we will be over at sunrise on Tuesday night at 6.30 Central Time. And be uh, me and Pastor Clement Chappelle preaching, 15 minutes each. So if you're able to, tune in and uh, get, get blessed. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us. We pray, Lord, for your blessings upon this day. And help us, Father, please, to serve you, to love you, be all that we can be for you. We ask you, Father, for those who've gone astray, that they would come back to you. And those who are floundering in their faith, to, to, to get back upon that solid rock so they can get growing again for you. We ask you, Father, for all the prayer requests but made known in the unspoken, that you take care of them according to your holy will. And I ask you, Father, one more time here real quickly for Mom and Dad and uh, all that they're dealing with down there in Tennessee. For your blessings upon them for the healing that they need. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and amen.